I have what will be an interesting lesson on my favorite book of the Bible, the book of Proverbs, and I trust that this will help many people uh, increase their discernment and knowledge of the scriptures. So who is wise? That is my question, because the book of Proverbs has more references to wisdom than any other book in the Bible. So that said, please look at the screen or turn in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 1. I'm going to read the first four verses, starting with verse 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity, to give subtlety to the simple, to the young man knowledge and discretion. I wanted to read those verses because that's how Proverbs starts out. The purpose is laid out by God. And the amount of wisdom that this book will give a Bible believer, a saved person, is immeasurable. I have found this book to be incredible in building my own personal spiritual vocabulary taught to me by the Holy Spirit. And it was the first book that I recall reading after I was saved. So that said, I'm going to cover these topics uh, as part of this presentation today. As I mentioned, the book of Proverbs is the first book I recall reading when I was a simple person, uh, saved yet simple in my understanding. I had not read God's word and I prayed and I opened to where I felt a conviction and I started reading the book of Proverbs. And I don't recall reading in any specific order. I just skipped around based on my conviction. Over time, I built up a list of spiritual vocabulary. I would make study notes and record everything. As the Lord taught me, I could feel the power of the Holy Spirit teaching me, putting understanding in my mind, taking out natural wisdom and filling it with God's spiritual wisdom as a vessel that had to be emptied before I could be filled. There are great associations in the book of Proverbs to the rest of Scripture, and I'm going to give some examples. And then I'm going to talk about wise and foolish people and scriptures. I believe there is no spiritual wisdom in any of the modern Bibles today, and there's no spiritual wisdom according to God in any lamps without oil. So I'm going to contrast toward the end of this lesson uh, some examples of wise counsel and foolish counsel according to God. And then I'll give a brief conclusion. I'm going to read Proverbs chapter 1, verse 22. How long, ye simple ones, will you love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. That should be a rhetorical question. God is asking the question so that we, who are believers, can understand that we need to take heed and listen to him. In Proverbs chapter 8, verse 5, it says, O ye simple, understand wisdom, and ye fools, be ye of an understanding heart. God is again giving counsel to people, but few actually are convicted to get God's counsel. Plain speech is for those who would believe in Jesus Christ. Save people also receive spiritual lessons because they are no longer simple in their understanding. God will call them wise when they are built up by God's power. When you receive spiritual understanding, and it's no longer only natural, only plain, God can use you as a vessel. But he needs to take the dross out of all of us, starting with what Bibles are we in, and then taking the dross off of our own understanding, getting rid of corrupt understanding, and becoming acute in our discernment, subtlety, as God says. So I'm going to go into this topic a little bit further here, but 
I was once a very simple person that when I read scripture initially I received only a natural understanding. It didn't take long though for the Lord to train me on spiritual things by his power. So I'm going to share probably a lot more spiritual vocabulary than I normally do and I'm going to call out specific terms that I think are relevant especially in the book of Proverbs. Uh, and so looking at this uh, on the first page here I would like to point out the word apple. Apple is symbolic of wisdom and that's important if you read the book of Proverbs because the book of Proverbs has a major topic and that major topic is wisdom and there are several spiritual terms that God uses for wisdom and apple is one of them. Um, another example is let's just say cloud. Clouds are prophets or Bibles so unlike a natural mind that sees clouds only as the literal God tells us that clouds on a spiritual level are the prophets that drop down his word when he tells them to. I'm going to continue on to the next slide and taking a look at it here. Um, I. I is a very important term that also describes wisdom. You can have the eyes of a fool which means that you're a natural person that doesn't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ or God can give you spiritual vision and make you wise so that you have his wisdom. Um, fire. Fire is symbolic of words. God's words or men's words. Wise words or foolish words. Those are two terms that I'd like to call out on this particular slide that are notable as far as the book of Proverbs go but all of these are very critical to understanding spiritual things in Scripture. Continuing on I'm going to call out gold. Gold is symbolic of wisdom and right above it so is fruit. So we need to know this as we're reading the book of Proverbs and you need to have cross references throughout Scripture where the Lord has taught you spiritual things to associate wisdom and gold together. Uh, looking down uh, in terms of other types of terms, harlot. Harlot would be a false church, not just a literal harlot or prostitute, as you will find in the apologetics and margin notations in many of the modern Bibles, or here as many pastors give sermons, but a harlot is symbolic of a false church that's whoring against God because all flesh is condemned. So if all of our flesh is condemned, all we have left to offer is belief and faith in Jesus Christ, which few have. And then if you have belief in Jesus Christ, you can be born again into a spiritual body that understands spiritual things. But um, very few people understand what a harlot is on a spiritual level. I'm going to continue on to the next slide. Looking at this, I would have to say if I pointed out any one item, let's go down to rain. Rain would be doctrine or blessings or symbolic of the word of God that the prophets drop down when God tells them to. The C would be masses in society. So a bunch of people represent the C. Um, and if you're unsaved, you're as a raging wave in the sea, foaming out shame because you don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. One more term that I'm going to point out that's very relevant to the book of Proverbs is silver. Silver is symbolic of the word of God as it's written in the book of Psalms, but also you, you get the word of God giving you understanding of his word. So silver represents understanding that you get from reading the word of God, or if it's a counterfeit scripture, you get 
bad understanding from corrupt silver with dross in it. So I'll get to that a little bit more. And everyone here can pause and study these terms and you should all have your own list of spiritual vocabulary that you keep in your study notes to periodically go through and refresh yourselves uh, if necessary, only if necessary. Doing another slide here, I'm going to say sister at the very top is also symbolic of wisdom. That's important to understand because it's very, um, it's not commonly understood when God talks about sisters or kinswoman in his word. He leaves a lot of people perplexed, in my opinion, based on having talked to many that have read the word. I'm trying to look at what else can I point out. I'll go all the way down to the bottom. Wind is doctrine and so is wine, the bottom two terms. Very important to understand those in terms of the book of Proverbs because they're referenced there. And so we need to understand as Christians what God is talking about when he describes things that include wind and wine. And then on this slide, we've got woman being symbolic of a church. So we've got the bride of Christ, and then we've got Babylon, the harlot church, the mother of harlots, that gives birth to false churches or creates false churches. So woman is very important in terms of a spiritual definition in the book of Proverbs. Um, I'm going to get into that a little bit more shortly. Wormwood is also another term that we need to understand. It means corruption or corrupt words. So wormwood is spiritually symbolic of corrupt water, bitter water. What's water? The water of the word. So wormwood means corruption. It means, yea, hath God said, a definitive disbelief in the Lord Jesus Christ is associated with wormwood. A false Bible, a false testimony. Okay, so we've got pictures here of two different types of women. I've got natural pictures here depicting spiritual things. One of a true church, obedient in the correct word of God, and the other one drunk because they don't know the Lord. And we need to have compassion on everyone and get out and witness to the lost. But this helps put in perspective the spiritual discernment, the subtlety that true Christians reading and feeding on the pure word of God have. So Proverbs, in terms of my own uh, testimony, uh, was able to help me speak with the new tongue and have the ability to confess Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, not with my natural tongue, but with a spiritual tongue with God's wisdom, being able to confess what the Lord has taught me back to him, giving me spiritual vocabulary, which is needed to make oneself wise at a spiritual level so that you can receive the counsel from the Lord and he can give you instruction on what he wants you to know and do. There's plenty of lessons in the book of Proverbs about God's wisdom reproving men's wisdom. I mean, just you could pick up modern Bibles and, and see what their understanding is, and it is absolutely nothing like what the Lord teaches through the power of the Holy Spirit. Number one, the words have been changed in modern Bibles. And secondly, you know, they, they have no understanding beyond their own natural um, perceptions of what the Lord is talking about. And I'm going to give an example or two of that coming up here shortly. And then... Throughout the book of Proverbs, there's review of prophecies that are going on that we all need to know about today because God's word is timeless and he's reminding us in the book of Proverbs of how unsaved people in the Babylonian church are trying to undermine and manipulate the saints of the Most High and how they're plotting evil against the world and what type of behaviors they're doing to offend God. These are major themes throughout the book of Proverbs that 
go over many people's heads because they don't have the right Bible and they don't have the right discernment. So there's lots of prophecies there. I'll touch on this briefly. So I'm going to start with perhaps my favorite proverb. Uh, Proverbs chapter 17, verse 24. You cannot change one word in scripture without penalty. So it says, Wisdom is before him that hath understanding, but the eyes of a fool are in the ends of the earth. So when I first read that, I remember this is going back probably 17 years ago, I'm guessing. Um, and it was amazing how the Lord was able to show me what he's talking about because he knew having, you know, survived the chastisement and, uh, you know, making it through there and enduring the chastening, I was able to um, then continue to read the word of God and get a greater understanding by the Lord's power. And it was all the Lord. I mean, he put things in my mind by his power that my natural understanding could never perceive. So how did that link to somewhere else in scripture? Well, one place is Revelation chapter 13, verse 18. I was convicted to look somewhere in the Bible for him that hath understanding. Just that statement, just those one, two, three, four words. God put on my heart, find four words in a row in this sequence, him that hath understanding. Just find those. And once I did, then I was told, look for wisdom. It's before him that hath understanding. So I found the word wisdom in the verse of Scripture right before him that hath understanding. And it was in Revelation chapter 13, verse 18. And it starts out, here is wisdom. It's almost personalized, like, hey, John, here is wisdom. Those three words are critical. You can't change a single word. And I believe every single Reformation Bible had just those three words. Here is wisdom. That's it. There's nothing else. If you look at the modern Bibles, a lot of them say their own interpretations of what that says. Like this calls for wisdom or wisdom is needed here. And all this stuff which is foolish and filled with nonsense to God. So here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. This has perplexed nearly everyone on earth. So then the Lord taught me in Proverbs chapter 16, how much better is it to get wisdom than gold and to get understanding rather to be chosen than silver? So the Holy Spirit taught me to associate gold and wisdom together and silver and understanding with God's word. And then in 1 Kings chapter 10, it says, Now the weight of gold, and I'm thinking of wisdom as well, that came to Solomon in one year was 603 score and six talents of gold. So when I went back and I read Revelation chapter 13, verse 18, I also am understanding here is not only wisdom, but here is gold as well. And gold is containing a number 603 score and six as it does in 1 Kings chapter 10. God is just using spiritual terms interchangeably, and he's doing this because the world is confounded and they don't hear his speech. They overcomplicate things. The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness to him. Neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. So I wanted to share that with you because there's two Proverbs there critical to understand end time prophecy continuing on it says in proverbs chapter 11 where no counsel is the people fall but in the multitude of counselors there is safety so a lot of people in the christian community in fact i would have to say the majority of who i've talked to about this all believe that it's a consensus base that if you're a saved Christian, you're a counselor, and where most saved Christians agree in interpretation of Scripture, there's safety in that interpretation. That's what's been portrayed to me. So when I read the rest of the canon of Scripture, it says in Psalm 118, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. 
And then I read in the New Testament, let God be true and every man a liar. And then I finally read in the book of Psalms, Psalm 119, verse 24, thy testimonies also are my delight and my counselors. So going back to Proverbs chapter 11, where no counsel is, the people fall, but in the multitude of counselors there is safety. In other words, where you have a multiple set of prophecies contained within God's word, and the Holy Spirit connects all of them, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little, as it says in Isaiah chapter 28, you're going to have a safe interpretation because the Holy Spirit is our comforter and he's there to show us what he gave the prophets to record. Okay, God is one and the only way to understand God's word on a spiritual level is by God's power. Okay, and then of course in Revelation chapter 3, it says, and Jesus Christ is giving counsel to one of the churches, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. So we know that fire is associated with the word of God and gold is wisdom. So Jesus Christ is telling this church, you know, he's counseling them to get wisdom from his word. Okay, so that they that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. In other words, get wisdom through my word, believe on me, so that you can be saved and have durable raiment. Have the, uh, the white linen, clean and white, fine linen is the righteousness of saints, the blood of the lamb, the word of the testimony, so that you have spiritual vision so that you have a covering, a protection of salvation, that you're not found naked and destitute without God's protection and salvation. That's what the council means to the church of Laodicea. In Proverbs chapter 25, it says, Take away the dross from the silver, and there shall come forth a vessel for the finer. In Proverbs chapter 26, it says, Burning lips and a wicked heart are like a potsherd covered with silver dross. Dross is corruption. Dross is all of the impure metals and impurities in natural silver that when you melt natural silver, the impurities bubble up to the surface like a slag or a scum, and you take a piece of ceramic or what's called a pot's herd, whatever it is made out of, and you use that to skim off the slag so that you can toss the slag onto the ground and it's got a lot of silver, tin, brass, dirt, you know, carbon, whatever in it, and what's left is a pure silver ingot. So it says in Isaiah chapter 1, Thy silver is become dross, thy wine mixed with water. So God is telling people that their Bibles have been corrupt because the silver represents the word of God and the understanding that you get from it. It says in Ezekiel chapter 22, Son of man, the house of Israel is to me become dross. All they are brass and tin and iron and lead in the midst of the furnace. They are even the dross of silver. God is just saying that people have been corrupted by the world. Babylon has misled. They've deceived all her, all the nations by her sorceries, and the devils deceived the whole world by casting doubt on the word of God. What type of spiritual discernment do we have in today's church? Very, very poor, if any. Okay, and in terms of the modern churches, they're just lost. They're in the wrong Bibles. So I wanted to share a couple of these proverbs and how they tie in to other places in scripture with people to get an appreciation of how important it is to have your spiritual vocabulary in place. Proverbs 31, I wanted to talk about this because in almost every church I've been in, you know, on, on Mother's Day, they read out of Proverbs chapter 31 in tribute to the mothers and the Christian mothers specifically. Who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. And then you guys can read the rest of this. Okay. 
And then I'm going to go to the next slide where it continues on. And, you know, it says in, in verse 26, She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. So you can read Proverbs chapter 31, but to me, when I read it, it's describing the bride of Christ. I'm not reading about a natural woman at all, necessarily. Yes, there is plain speech there. And I do acknowledge that it's valid that God is using plain speech, but he's describing something spiritual to the saints. Not to invalidate the natural understanding, of course, but the real lesson here is about the bride of Christ and the attributes that the bride of Christ has that are cross-referenced throughout this rest of Scripture. Okay, so uh, the last verse says, Give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. What did I say fruit is symbolic of? Wisdom. Okay, so he's closing out the book of Proverbs. In conclusion, the last verse of Proverbs 31, at least the one that I show on the screen here, is referencing wisdom, the wisdom of her hands. What has she done? And is this a reference to spiritual hands that you can only have if you're a saved Christian? And the bride of Christ is neither male nor female. All are one in Christ Jesus. So please pray about that and read that uh, with faith and with prayer and See what the Lord convicts you to believe and discern. I would always advise that to every person who identifies as a Christian. Are you a Christian? Have you received the Holy Spirit? And what type of spiritual things are you learning as you read God's word through faith, with faith? Because without faith, it's impossible to believe God. This is God's word is for those who truly believe it. And then he will reveal spiritual things in accordance with his will to whom he chooses. Another proverb I would like to share is Proverb 23, verse 23, Buy the truth and sell it not, also wisdom and instruction and understanding. So when I read that, I'm associating truth with Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and Wisdom and instruction and understanding come from God's word. Um, wisdom and gold are synonymous spiritually, and understanding and silver, silver being representative of the word of God, I'm associating by God's power as well. So, you know, you have to have the truth of God's word, and you don't sell it because it was given freely to you. If the truth is provided to you freely by the Most High and the only currency you had was faith, faith that was taken and paved from the foreskin of your heart as God took the hardness off your heart and prepared you to receive the truth, all you had to offer God was faith in Jesus Christ. That was it. There's nothing else that any of us have that God desires or wants. Uh, our works of the flesh are condemned already. Uh, there's no goodliness in us. There's none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So all we have is faith in the word of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, once I understood by the truth and sell it not, that I could not make a commercial living out of all the wisdom that God was filling me with, it would, it would not be right. It's not the will of God for me. That's my own personal testimony. He knows I'm not going to try to sell my own merchandise as if it were mine and I'm going to make a literal profit off of something. I'm freely giving, as it says in Scripture. This is not to say I'm against any missionaries making sustenance wages or any publishers making what I would call fair sustenance wages. God's going to set up people for his purpose throughout the world, save people. But for me personally, I'm not going to sell what God has given me for free. And it says in Revelation chapter 13, And that no man might buy or sell, save that he had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Um, so this is a spiritual testimony. Nobody is going to be able to buy or sell the truth. 
unless you subscribe to Antichrist. They're thinking of making laws to outlaw anything but one final ecumenical Bible. And this is a lesson that you will find in God's Word. Okay? Thinks to change times and laws. Um, but buying and selling to me has a spiritual meaning as well as a literal meaning. And I'm going to trust in the Lord and not put confidence in men as far as what my discernment is of end time prophecy. There are many more references to wisdom in the book of Proverbs than any other book in God's Word. There is a great contrast between man's wisdom, which is foolish to God, and God's wisdom, which is foolish to men, in the book of Proverbs. You might say, well, why do you say God's wisdom is foolish to men? Well, how many different versions of the Bible do we have in English alone? Because natural men don't perceive spiritual things. So, the Bibles keep getting dumbed down to the point where they're so dumb in their natural understanding. There is no spiritual wisdom in, in them. As soon as you change one word, the, uh, the, the light doesn't shine anymore and uh, a spirit of slumber is sent. If you don't have oil in your lamp at all, then there is no uh, salvation. We know that from the parable of the virgins in Matthew chapter 25. So what type of gold do you have? Do you have fool's gold or God's gold? And what type of wisdom does this represent? A wisdom of a fool or wisdom of someone that is wise according to God? The problems with the earth, Babylon's problems, Babylon being the earth, another name for the earth, and the earth's church, and all their corrupt understanding of the natural world is in Revelation chapter 18, verse 12, in all thine wood. God is telling the people of the earth that they've got their wood, which is nothing more than a big giant cluster of idols, idolatry. So he's saying, thine wood. And it says in Proverbs chapter 26, where no wood is, there the fire goeth out. So where there is no tail bearer, the strife ceaseth. So to take away wood is to take away a bad type of fire, which God is telling us is symbolic or related to strife. It says in the next verse, as coals are to burning coals and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. So going back, you're a raging wave of the sea foaming out your own shame. As a natural person, you have none of God's wisdom. You look and judge things by appearance. You trust your eyes. You trust your own perceptions. You trust everything that you think is right or wrong, but you're not trusting in the Lord with all your heart. And so going back to Revelation chapter 18, verse 12, God says, in all thine wood, meaning all of your own built-up wisdom and idolatry that's going to be burned away by the fire that comes out of the mouth of God at the judgment seat of Christ or at the great white throne judgment. Okay? So I just thought I'd share that with you. I think almost all modern Bibles butcher and change the word there to confound people. Uh, but it's all thine wood. God is pointing the finger right back at the earth for their idolatry. Uh, this is something that I'm going to try not to laugh, but I'm going to share with you guys. Many of you know I was a former pastor, and I've been to a lot of churches, both Catholic churches as well as Protestant or Christian churches, let's say. And <clears throat> I've heard countless pastors explain uh, the topic of wine to their congregations. And I remember one Baptist church I was at, I'm going to say it was probably 15 years ago, the pastor liked to give 90-minute sermons, or close to it. Maybe, maybe it was closer to 75 minutes, but it, they were very, very long. And I found them it, uh, to be very difficult to listen to because of his discernment that he was getting. In God's word, it says in Proverbs chapter 23, verse 31, look 
not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. Hold that thought for a second. When you read that, what are you discerning? Before you answer, or before I start commenting further, I'm going to read what the Amplified Bible says. And this Amplified Bible is published by the Lachman Foundation, uh, Freemason, Franklin Dewey Lachman, bought the rights to the James Strong, Westcott and Hort, uh, Vatican-influenced American Standard Version, and they revised it back in the mid-60s, right about the time when Vatican II was concluding. They released it shortly after uh, that time. And their text is very similar to the text of almost every modern Bible. And it says, Do not look at wine when it is red when it sparkles in the glass, when it goes down smoothly. Okay, so that's what God is their God, their rock, which is not my rock, but that's what the Amplified Bible says. So now we have a problem. What is the Lord talking about? The true Most High God is talking about something that's not privately interpreted because when you read verse 31, he's simply cross-referencing what he's already taught you somewhere else in scripture on a spiritual level all right i'm going to throw this out and feel free to not believe it believe the lord is what i'm asking you to but when i read verse 31 he's simply talking about the image of the beast how it's going to appear to be so deceptive and so believable that everyone on earth is going to swear it's the word of god why do i say that because wine is doctrine Red is the color of the scarlet beast. And uh, his color in the cup is a reference to the Most High because in the book of Jeremiah, God talks about in, in the cup of his hand, in, there is a golden cup in the hand of the Lord. And the wine is what color? The wine is red. Okay, and God's going to make the earth drunk. He continues to make the earth drunk because they don't believe his word. You know, the people say they're drunk because of the words of God's holiness. God speaks the truth. Few believe them. Everyone else is drunk. Okay? If something moves itself aright, it means it appears to be correct. But it's not because we have God's counsel. The Amplified Bible, the people are confounded here. They have a natural understanding only. And that's why I wanted to use this example because this is like every proverb. You have to have the AV 1611. You have to have the English Bible that's the pure word of God. Okay? And then you will understand spiritual things if you're a saved person and if the Lord gives you the power to discern these things. Okay? Um, but if you're going to believe the Amplified Bible, then you better not be going to the liquor store, Costco. You better not ever buy red wine and look at it when it's in a glass. You better not go into any bar. You better stick with your whiter wines, uh, your Rieslings, your dessert wines, because something about the, these red dinner wines are, are evil then. They go down smoothly, and you're, you're going to be a fool if you get a little tipsy, if you feel the effects, because you're offending God by drinking a glass of wine. That's, that's what the sermons that I've listened to the pastors I've heard get fixated on the natural understanding to the point where they're putting so much of a burden on their congregations for righteous fleshly behavior that they miss the major point of what God is telling the saints. And that is spiritually, don't follow these dumb idols, these corrupt dumb idols of Babylon because God's going to put his sword into the hand of the king of Babylon and the image of the beast is going to be so deceptive that everyone on earth, unless you're a saved Christian, is going to swear it's the word of God. See the book of Zechariah. See the book of Proverbs. You know, th this is something taught all throughout Scripture, book of Revelation, etc. Okay, so that's the difference between God's wisdom and men's wisdom. And this is my firsthand testimony of what the Lord has taught me out of his pure word and what I've heard from people that are reading these dumb idols. Dumb idols such as the New King James, the Amplified Bible, the Revised Standard Version, the American Standard Version, the NIV, the New American Standard Version, 
etc., etc., etc. It seems like a never-ending list of all these corrupt Bibles. So in conclusion, the book of Proverbs gives wisdom to saved people. There are many links to prophecies and the spiritual meanings are important to discern. The Babylonian church is admonished by God for their lack of belief in the true God and their counterfeiting of scripture. So the world doesn't believe on the true Lord Jesus Christ. They comfort themselves by creating false Christ and false prophets, if it were possible, would deceive even the very elect, as it says in the book of Matthew. And the counterfeiting of scriptures is a major, major theme throughout the word of God. He is rebuking the world, reproving them, for making dumb idols, molten images, graven images with their own hands in accordance with their own understanding. And you need the book of Proverbs to become wise so that you have wise counsel. I will read Proverbs chapter 16, verse 16 to close. How much better is it to get wisdom than gold and to get understanding rather to be chosen than silver? I'll conclude on that. And I really hope you guys pause and study and pray and trust the Lord for guidance here. The book of Proverbs is such a great book, very interesting to read, building spiritual vocabulary and connecting everything else throughout God's word. Thank you guys for listening and watching.